Welcome back to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. I'm Rocky Snyder. This week, I'm going to introduce a new friend, a guy I met at a conference just a couple months ago. He used to play for the San Francisco 49ers, the Kansas City Chiefs. Nowadays, he's a fantastic strength conditioning coach in the Las Vegas area. Sean Manuel, or Shandor Manuel, or Manny for that matter, he's going to jump into the conversation, and we're just going to get going. I hope you enjoy. Remember to subscribe. It was really fun listening to your presentation, following along at the, uh, at the Nevada State Clinic from the NSCA in Vegas yeah. uh, back in, was it November? Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, it was great. And, and I just couldn't wait to connect with you and uh, get you on the podcast here. But you just, let's do a little background story. But before we get up to speed with the Institute of Human Performance and what you're doing right now, you went to New Mexico State, you played football, you get drafted, was that 90, 96? 96. 96, you get drafted by the Niners. You end up playing for the Chiefs. And uh, tell me a little bit, because I don't delve into, I don't talk to a lot of the pro players, but uh, I usually, on this show, we talk to the coaches and the staff behind what makes the teams great aside from the players. But this is kind of a unique opportunity. So what was it like to be an NFL player uh, in the mid to late 90s? And, and how long did you play for? When did you, re you retired in 2001, right? Yes. So a couple of, it was NFL, what an incredible fraternity and a credible group of people to be around when you're, and, and, and in particularly, I got to be with the Niners during a very unique time. And the more I get around organizations and watch how people do business and do all those kind of things, and the older I get, the more mature I get, the more in awe I get of the level of development, the establishment, the professionalism that existed over there at San Francisco, right? Uh, during that time. And when I say there was a culture there of excellence the players permeated it the players spun the culture harder than and more intensely than the coaches did the players would come up and threaten you hey man you're gonna get i'll get you cut you like you get out of here in a minute if you don't figure this out you know kind of deal but they were also very supportive and wanted to see you be great right but they weren't gonna let go of the standards so playing in the nfl i had a unique experience to be at the niners it was like wow this place is elite well, you grew up there, right? You you grew up in I grew up in the Bay Area. Area. So uh, that must have been a dream come true. I watched the Super Bowls on TV as a kid. I grew up with all the, uh, the Niners is my favorite team. So I heard I was going to get drafted. I was like, Man, I can't believe I'm about to get drafted by the Niners. Um, <laughs> my dream dream team growing up. The the NFL is an incredibly intense place, and for me personally, you know the areas that I looked at playing. I'm always transparent about things. The mental is 80 to 90% of the game. Be able to work through and navigate the different terrains that you have to, the injury, um, coaches changing, them having different preferences, trying to understand what it is people want. The team, the chemistry team changing, different personalities coming in. There's a, there's a, there's a mindset that you have to have. I wish I was stronger at it at the time. I wasn't as strong mentally. There was areas of my character and perspective I didn't really need to grow in, kind of like what we talked about. I grew up in Richmond, California. You get a frame of reference for things that always isn't the healthiest. You get a map that isn't always necessarily the best. You try and navigate life with it. it's not the most productive. So when I was there, I was, you know, I, it, was, it was an amazing opportunity. I didn't get to enjoy it as much as I would have liked to have because of the perspective. When I look back at it, I'm really grateful for the time that I had and even the opportunity. Like when I, by the time I got to Kansas City, I'd been hurt. I don't know, I had five surgeries by that point or four surgeries. And I was just grateful I got to be around as long as I did. I technically probably only played one season, two seasons. That was NFI. I was on injured reserve. You know, I, I would kept around. And then, you know, pretty soon I just kind of faded out. But I think one of the biggest things with the NFL experience is the people I was able to be around and take some of the, the expertise that they had, how they built, was priceless. I got Pete Carroll, right? He was a sensational coach, Mike Solari, who's now, you know, he's been a, a coordinator and O-line coach. He's really well known around the league, but these guys passed on things I still use as a coach to this day. You know, philosophies I still hold on to this day. Bill Walsh, who was absolutely the cornerstone, right? You know, George Seifert, who was an amazing coach uh, as well. I got to be around those guys and really, and, and have a relationship with them and really learn. And they mentored me and helped me become a better person just the seeds took a while to kind of take root right at the end of the day and like I said when I was at Kansas City I was there um learned a lot you know as I watched from an organizational standpoint 
as I seen things trans transpire, but was kind of on my back end by the time I got there, you know, and it's a lot of my premise when we're talking now, I thought what you talked about was so fascinating. All right. The reason why is the postural control piece and the posture was single handedly one of the biggest things, my lack of it, that created all the issues systemically in my body, all the injury. My knee would internally rotate and, and I didn't control it very well because of the pronation in my foot. I had a loose ligament on that inside, on the inside of my foot. I never knew that. It would give me more play. So when we go to cut, it gave me more torque when I would turn, but it also created more tension on the hip and it would, I mean, on the knee because it would, my hip would tighten to try and control the range of motion at the knee, right? As a result, I kept tearing my ACL. I tear my lateral meniscus because that shearing force, obviously you're going in, you keep doing it. And my, my medial collateral ligament, I would tear over and over again. I could not understand it and how it kept happening over and, and the frequency it would happen. One year, three times in one year. I got a surgery, came back, played 10 days later, did it again, got into the playoffs and did it again. And was just like, man, what is happening? It wasn't until I got out of the league and started getting into training and fitness and getting educated. I think it was NASM. It was the first time I started looking at corrective measures. And I was like, holy smokes. Oh, this is why. Oh, some of this is preventable. Some of this yeah. could be manageable. And so even now from that background that I had of being very, you know, having a ton of injuries, I think I'm up to eight now in terms of reconstructions and surgeries. The big thing for me is do you deal with these underlying issues at the postural control, the technical proficiency, um, the joint mobility, the flexibility, the stabilization, or as critical a variable as anything when you're developing the athletes in terms of their longevity? Because availability trumps ability at some point. If you're not available, <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. I don't care how good you are. Um, and no knock, you, like you look at McCaffrey, they just paid him a bunch of money. That kid is sensational. He's three years. I don't know how many, he's, he's been injured a lot of the time, right? And they can't get the guy on the field. So anyway, when I'm looking at it, uh, and I had a chance to talk with when the strength job came open at the Niners, uh, one of the uh, assistants that was, that was taking the, the resumes and stuff. And I told him, I said, hey man, it looks like this injury resistance standpoint is one of the biggest things that I have in this um, that could help with. And I think it's one of the most pivotal things. I look at things from a PT out standpoint. So from an acute PT standpoint out, because when I look at a lot of these guys, they have a lot of underlying issues, a lot of compensation uh, issues yeah. because they have such super physiologies. They can work around it. Exactly. The, the greatest athletes are the greatest cheaters, so to speak. You know what I mean? You nailed it. And so when you talk about background, that's professional sports, that's background coming into strength conditioning. That's been my influence uh, in a lot of ways. That's why what I, when you started talking about it, I was like, there it is. That's it. That's what we're looking for. Um, that's, that's the pivotal piece. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and, you know, not to throw uh, strength coaches under the bus or, or athletic trainers or anything in the NFL, because they're amazing. They're in the top class. They're in the, the top tier of, of the industry. Uh, and yet you got to kind of go, why are there so many non-contact injuries going on? Can it be kind of related back to how they are conditioning their body? And then when you start to look conditioning programs, you start to begin scratching your head going, well, I don't, I don't know why we're doing this or why we're doing this. Shouldn't we focus a little bit more on that? Um, and it, it's good that people are starting to question it because it's just going to make a more resilient athlete. When you, so this is the big part, even what you just talked about. The strength coaches, the trainers are a wealth of information. They have incredible backgrounds. They're incredibly knowledgeable. They're exceptional at what they do and their understanding of team dynamic and what they're building. Some of the stuff, like even with the postural control and these other things, are so relatively uh, new. And when I say it, not new in terms of their practice, but from the evidence they're starting to collect from a science standpoint, from a research standpoint, that it's just starting to get introduced. And what happens with any paradigm, 
the people with the most investment in that paradigm have the most to lose when it starts to change because you just built your whole career on this paradigm, right? Right. And so you're going to be the slowest to change because if the theory of relativity was what you built your career on, all of a sudden you're finding out, oh, wait, maybe it's not, maybe there's other alternative things. Then you're like, well, wait a minute, what does that mean for me? And I have to learn that now. That puts me back in a novel state where I don't know this as well. And it's the unknown. And a lot of, I don't care who it is, not just them, all of us in life, we can kind of struggle with the unknown. Like we want what's familiar and what's comfortable. The other part is that it's built on a network of relationship that a lot of the, the, the NFL, all of it and in life are built on networks of relationship. If I can talk the same language as you and we see things the same, you feel more comfortable with me. When we talk about things from the same paradigm, we have a unity. Well, what that means is that it's going to take time for that new thought to kind of infuse itself and make sense in a non-threatening way that we're not here to replace or say you're not known or this is another place to explore. Um, I got contacted two years ago and it was from uh, the, one of the uh, head coach, a uh, big gizzy over at Green Bay Packers. And he's like, hey, that correct, you know, we were going back and forth. And I said, hey, if I could come in and help out and do these things, and, hey, that corrective piece could be a big one. But let's not use that terminology, right? Because uh, it's sensitive. Since I've been around the guys, we had 17 NFL guys in last uh, pre-camp in the summer. It's a big deal, the way injuries perceived, why you're doing things. Like we call it bulletproofing, right? Hey, let's, let's Teflon you. Hey, let's, let's do, let's do um, career, uh, uh, you know, availability. Let's do, um, you know, um, injury resistance training. Build your resistance up to injury. Um, not let's correct something that's off, right? Yep. And then and you, you nailed it. Let me say this. Out of the 17 guys that came in, 15 of the guys needed massive postural control movement restoration work. 15, and when I say massive, like couldn't do squats anymore. And we're talking about guys who were six-year-old pros. It's crazy. About, I mean, this is, this, is, this is why we here in our studio create a timeline. I want to know... What's happened over the course of your experience of, of yes. life from, yes. from actually, if you have birthing records, I mean, not to get too extreme, but there could be issues just from the get go that started this whole kind of negotiating this part of my body with that part of my body and then throw into it any accident, any injury, whether it was blunt force trauma or anything else you start, especially like if you're in your youth and, and you're just a toddler and something happens, don't be surprised if that was the cornerstone from which all of this compensatory patterning started to develop. And you don't notice it because you're young and vibrant and so on, but then you start going under load or you start doing extreme actions and you're on a playing field. And the next thing you know, nobody hit your shoulder, but now your shoulder separated or something's gone on. Your ACL is blown out, your MCL. You've shifted some disc in your lumbar. And it's not because you got hit. It's because the negotiation just went sideways. It's why I love not just what you talked about, but on top of what you talked about, you have a strength and conditioning background. It's not like you came and, and, and not, uh, let me ask this too. Do you have a PT background too? No, just 25 years of studying posture, that's, that's substantial. mechanics and biomechanics. That's substantial. I, and, and whether you do or don't, all I have to do is listen for a minute and go, but that nails it. That, it it's inconsequential. The effect is going to be substantial based on the information I just heard of the mm. valuation. But the fact of what you shared on top of the background, you have a strength and conditioning background and you're into this postural control and you see these different things and what you're talking about, it, it, those are the things that have the greatest impact. And to me, it's the direction things are going to end up in inevitably as people, the more this research comes out, the more they explore it, the more they understand that if you have 9 million, they did a study and I have it on a file and it was a Fiori and 9 million kids a year overuse issues that are preventable through biomechanical intervention and volume control. It's a study. They went right through it. Right. And they showed the variables that have this impact on these kids. It's contributing to burnout. 
right? The more of these that come out, the more, I think the more educated we get in terms of understanding what these studies do, and then we can kind of interpret them because, you know, studies, you got to peer review, they have their limitations too, but sure. the more we get that information and we can kind of go, okay, now let's make sense of it as a community. Let's process. The more I think we're going to see things like people with your background, with the postural control background, start taking a more pivotal role, especially in the first four to six weeks in the regression and going forward in the maintenance and it, where it gets interwoven into the fabric of the year. Not like, hey, you got hurt. Now let's go do it. <laughs> no, no. The this prevention. is going to be something that starts to adopt a new philosophy or a new approach, like you're saying, that we look at strength conditioning with the filter of, where is this person standing against gravity and how do they take that resting posture and begin moving through space with it? So posture and gait mechanics overlay that onto somebody's strength conditioning program. Now we're talking, we're talking about individualized programs that can be adapted and adopted into a group setting to some degree, but everyone's unique. Like the way you move, Manny is like your wife could be, you could be wearing like a Holocaust cloak, walking down a hundred yards down the opposite side of the street. And she sees the backside of you walking. She's going to immediately understand that's, that's my husband because yes. she knows how you move and you've got a yes. particular way of moving. Now, this isn't going to be, this podcast is more about you and I'm going to switch the direction here. So that I want to learn more about you. But the cool thing is like you're saying, the, the pros, the athletic trainers, the strength coaches are starting to go, Oh, this is interesting. Um, I will most likely be on the East Coast working with an NFL team in their off season to do a little in-service. I got a couple major league baseball teams that are interested in me coming down to Arizona for spring training. Uh, I've mm. got uh, a local NHL team that wants me to come over work their medical and training staff. I mean, it's beginning to happen. And with your facility in which you're starting to do the same thing, you're bringing those NFL players, it's, it's going to be trickling down and not only into professional sports and not to get too much on a, a soapbox or anything, but that's where everything trickles down into this college level, into the high school level, into the general population. So with guys like yourself helping to, to blow the horn, lead the charge, I, I think we're going to see some amazing things with athletic Absolutely. performance in the next Absolutely. decade or two. So, so but back to you, I want to know, like, af it, it's funny. I, I think of this, old John Cusack movie back in the 80s. I say old movie. I sound like uh, from the Avengers or Spider-Man or whatever. Hey, you remember this old movie? It was called Better Off Dead. And he's, he's uh, trying to ski down this mountain. He's trying to win the girl. And one of these guys comes in with a full body cast. And he said, you know, I thought it was going to be everything after the Olympics seemed really easy. But so it just makes me think like people get to this pinnacle, like be, playing for your hometown team in the NFL and then going to the Chiefs and everything and even playing with the XFL. But at one point in time, you're like, OK, I've got to change. What was that like? Just I, I'm just curious, hmm. like mentally and spiritually, where did you have to go? Good question. OK, so again, growing up in the environment I grew up in and, and like I, I, in the snapshot, I grew up in this area that was rural. During the time, there wasn't a great level of acceptance for people who were different on top of people that crossed lines. And my mother was Sicilian, my father was Pan-African. And so the, it, we were in the seventies, biracial couples, we're, it just wasn't well accepted at that point. I, I look at how much things have changed and grown. I'm like, this is amazing. But during that time, one of the things is, as a kid, you talked about you take injury when you're young and then everything kind of forms off of that. There's no difference spiritually or emotionally. You get injured emotionally and you're like, hey, I'm not acceptable. Is the color of my skin. For some reason, I get beat up when I come outside and people call me these bad names that seem that they're really negative. There's a lot of hostility towards me. There's a lot of hostility towards my family and a, lot of, a lack of acceptance. When I'm in the home, I don't experience that. I experience complete acceptance and tolerance and two people that love each other, even though they have different complected skins, colors. They, there's nothing different. They, they love each other. I couldn't tell that there's something different. My mother, Sicilian, she grew up in a Sicilian household now, okay? Father was second generation, place called Isola de la Femina off the coast of Palermo, all right? You didn't necessarily mix. This is how you do it. Even though in that community, they were big sports guys. And my, my, um, my, they, you know, my, my uncle, Hall of Fame, uh, California Hall of Fame high school uh, football coach, my other uncle, you know, chief of police, Galt, well-established police, very well-respected, right? We're all, they grew up around it in this, this duality. And so when you say leaving the NFL, 
when I came out of all that, the, the situation, what's my identity? Like my mother, I grew up, my mother's like, hey, my, my Italian prince is my Italian prince is my Italian prince. People are like, man, you're not Italian. Uh, you know, you're like, what am I? You know, kind of deal. And you're looking at your, your much, you're growing up eating dr- Trapino soup and ravioli. And everyone's like, what'd you have? That's not what brothers eat. You're like, I don't know, man. That's just what we have in my house. <laughs> you know, so, but what happened is all of a sudden you get to this medium called football and you play well. And guess what happens? All of a sudden you're acceptable. All of a sudden I don't care who it is. The, the local guys come out that were said really bigoted racist things and they watch you play and they go, Hey man, you're a stud dude. Like, man, you're amazing, man. I can't believe it, man. All of a sudden you're like, they're like, Hey, the twins, man, them dudes are awesome, man. Them dudes are amazing players. You ever seen those kids? And then everyone's like, Hey man, you're really good, man. I think you're going to play in college, man. And you're going to do this. And you're like, Oh, Hey, I'm starting to be acceptable. Yeah. Cause we didn't even mention it. You got a twin brother and he was drafted into the NFL the same year, right? Same year, same round, same team. Unbelievable. First time in NFL history that it was the same round of the same team with twins. Right. Uh, but when you say, hey, what was it like to go from a place where I was not accepted, I didn't feel highly accepted socially to feeling highly accepted socially, all of a sudden, I did, my, your identity starts to become around the game, your performance. Everything was about a performance to me. And from a spiritual standpoint, here's the thing. It's more about, now I know it, it's more about who you're becoming. It's more about the relationship than it is about the performance, right? And, but at the time, if I missed on something, I dropped the ball, I, I couldn't forgive myself. So as I'm playing and you're like, hey, what was it like when you're playing and, and I was acceptable and I'm playing at this high level and I'm at the Niners and they're the team of the decade and they're this monster rock star group. Anyone who's on them, you're a rock star. And you get all these perks and people are like, hey, you don't have to pay when you come into the restaurant. So when I had to walk out of that, when you talk about a real identity crisis, you talk about depression. Oh, who am I? Like, I'm useless. I'm worthless now. Like, I'm not, what's my value? Like, it's, my value is gone. Why? But my value is in my identity as a player. My identity was not in me as a person. I didn't put stock into that necessarily. I put stock into my ability to compete. Part of the reason my injury was so high is because how hard I trained. Well, what it you're was describing, life- you're describing something that normally occurs for people in their 60s. You know, they work so 30 years or more at a certain career occupation. They have labels, they have positions, they have an identity, and then they retire. I, it, you're talking about you're in your 30s. You're, you're so much younger. And I don't think many people really, really express, and, and we don't see it in the media. We don't, we don't see it out there as to, you know, what happens after life in professional sports. And, but you found, you found some guiding light, right? I, I know that you're, you're uh, connected to a ministry, You've, you have spiritual guidance, but it wasn't always there. And, and then the injuries helped prepare you in a certain other direction of corrective measures and working with others so they may not have to go through the same thing you went through. But how did that all come about? The biggest thing was... Coming out, um, I think when I got in, there was a sense like, hey, I can see how fast this is going to come and kind of go. Uh, I had an awareness of, because I'd sat down with some guys and they'd introduced in some Bible studies, spiritual principle to me. And I remember for the first time we were sitting down looking, I was like, oh, that makes sense to me. I can see why, but I don't totally understand it yet. As I went through these experiences in professional sports, the way I had went to make sense of my suffering was I pulled closer to that source because like for me, it's called God and Jesus Christ. When I talk to other people at times we're out, not because I'm ashamed of my faith or anything, but sometimes people go, people can, people can hear the principle and, and still listen because they can acknowledge that the universal principle is true and it covers life no matter what. Like if I tell you, Hey, you need to be a person with integrity, integrity builds trust and relationship. And the more integrity you have, the more trust you build. The more trust you build, the deeper the, the foundation for relationships. People aren't going to argue with me necessarily about the truth of that statement, right? If I share a scripture that goes to support it, you know, oh, wow, I didn't really necessarily know that was in there. So for me, when you're talking about this evolution, guys sat down, man, I never forget a guy by the name of Daryl Freeman sat down with me and said, hey, let's look, at the, let's look at the Bible. Let's go through these Bible studies. Let's talk about 
um, why you are a womanizer and why you have like five fiancés. Let's talk about what, like, what that really means, you know, in terms of the level of insecurity you have to have to, and how you're trying to deal with this level of insecurity you have by masking it with the attention of women or, you know, this, the things that come with it, the, the esteem of people. And let's talk about the result because you have this daughter now that you had out of wedlock. And this is why I was playing professional. You're sitting down when he goes, who doesn't have a father in the home, which you're just perpetuating the typical African-American man having kids, not taking responsibility. That's the demise of the community. And you're running around thinking you're a good guy. You're not a good guy. All right, let's walk through this. Let's look at some scripture to kind of break this down. And he went to 2 Timothy. I never forget some of these things, like two, three. Starting down in 16, it was like they're the kind who worm their way into weak role in his homes and gain control over them. They're loaded down with all kinds of sin. And as he's breaking this thing down, I didn't think of sin as you're a bad guy. I thought about it, and he helped me understand it's the wrong aim in life. Like, hey, sin is the Greek word for missing the mark. An archer would shoot at a target, and he would miss. And when he missed, he say, hey, you sinned. As long as you're aiming at the target, from a spiritual standpoint, the thing that helped me was grace. And me navigating this thing about my identity is grace is understanding that I'm unconditionally accepted. I'm loved, despite my weaknesses. I don't have to hide them. They're part of the thing that, from my spiritual life and my spiritual standpoint, God works through, you know, show his, his, his mercy and his grace, right? And for me, what I do is, hey, they don't condemn me. I had the hardest time because when your performance driven, any weakness is like, oh, you, you curse you. This is horrible. So when I started to come out of this and really start to tie these spiritual principles together, what, that was the thing that helped me get through the depression. That was the thing that, that really trying to internalize, hey, that shouldn't be my identity. My identity should be in Christ. Okay, what does that mean? My identity should be in, these, in who I'm becoming as a person and who I was called to become that has an infinite ability to impact the world around me for the positive. It has an infinite ability to live a quality life undefined by what's outside of me, but completely defined by what's inside of me, which can never be taken. I can only choose to give it away if I lose perspective. Right? You know, it's funny because I, I know there's a few people in the listening audience as they're, as they're listening along here and they're going, what the heck does this have to do with strength conditioning or athletic performance? And I got to say, it's got everything you can imagine it has to do with strength conditioning, athletic performance, because this is the, this is the corner of the triad that we talk about mind, body, spirit that we don't really talk about, right? It, only now, Manny, did this past year, 2021, uh, through Facebook and the National Strength Conditioning Association's post on there, there are some people that are actually starting a, a spiritual special interest group, a spirituality SIG for the NSCA. And you go, man, you know, I'm so glad somebody's stepping up for that. It's, it's about time. It's actually past time. Because you look at somebody and that is spiritually bankrupt. Let's say that they are hollow. What kind of posture will they assume? And then where does that put their physical body? Where does that put their energetics? Does that put them in a state of potential injury? Does that raise it? Heck yeah. And then you look at somebody that is walking along a path of brotherly love, of honesty, of integrity, of all the spiritual principles, and they exude a much different posture. They exude a posture that is much more balanced, which is essentially what we're trying to achieve is, is getting closer to a place that there is more balance than there is imbalance, right? Nailed it. Now, it's, you just said this too. The goal of the practitioner for me is the maximization of the potential of the athlete. Well, maximization starts in the mind of any athlete. Like without the mind, the body just does what the mind tells it to do. At whatever point your character breaks is the limit and the ceiling that you have. If, if, if I can push myself to whatever depth and allow myself to discipline, if I can undergo a level of discipline, sacrifice in the pursuit of my own excellence, dedication to the truth of the process, not always gonna go the way I want. This isn't always going to look the way I want. It doesn't matter. The question is, am I becoming who does I was meant to be through this process? That allow me to deal with the difficulties I'm dealing with. Hey, my life is a series of choices I make every day. I, responsibility. I'm responsible for those choices. I got to be response able. Those are all disciplines that you use in the pursuit of the maximization of your talent. The gift is the gift. Your athletic ability, whatever abilities that you have, those are gifts. The gift isn't the issue. 
What you do with the gift becomes the issue. And we're talking about sports and strength and conditioning. How do you help an athlete maximize the gifts they've been given? What if they have self-destructive tendencies? Hey, I just, I can't be on time. I don't care. I'm going to skip workouts. They have a self-value issue. Yeah. And, and we can name a whole bunch of names right now, which we won't. We don't need I'm not going to go in there. But you know who I, they are. They're bouncing <laughs> from one team to another, or they're the bad boy on the team that the coach is going, you know, oh. Hey, Rocky, I'm, I was, I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm a guy. I don't have to go far. I just go look in the mirror, see myself, and I go, the biggest, my biggest failures haven't become because of my talent at times. They've become because of my lack of discipline in different areas. So if I talk to an athlete, let's maximize your talent. I go, that's not what's going to limit him. Injury and lack of discipline are the two things that are going to cause the, the limitations. Is that going to be the priority in terms of how I start this thing from a messaging standpoint, from a programming standpoint, for an athlete? Well, I don't feel like I want to go into that. I know because you don't feel confident because it's the unknown. But here's the thing. If I unlock an athlete's mind, if I get them to buy in and to push at a deeper level than they've ever gone, if I get them to buy into different principles, I've changed that athlete exponentially. They're going to do the things that help them grow exponentially. And I know it for a fact. It's what I did at Bishop Gorman High School. When I was there, I was the architect. And what you talked about at NSCA, the biggest thing I did was I messaged the athletes with these spiritual principles. I'm working with three of them now. We're going into the NFL. They'll sit down and they'll shoot me back text quotes and those things back to me on spiritual principle. When I look at a spiritual principle in terms of helping people, there's a law of maximization. If you look at Matthew 25 and you go down to verse 25, it talks about the parable of the talents. And he said, hey, to this guy, the master gave five talents. This one he gave four and to this one he gave one. And he went on a journey. And when he came back, he said, hey, what'd you do with what I gave you? What'd you do with the gifts I gave you? And to the one he gave five, he said, he said, hey, I got five more. I doubled it. The other guy, he went, hey, I doubled what you gave me. Just gave you back four. He gave the one guy one. And the guy went, oh, you only gave me one. It must mean I'm not important. And what you gave me, I should go bury it. So he goes and buries it. And when he says, why'd you bury it? And he said, because I knew you were a hard man. And so I didn't want to disappoint you. So I went and buried the talent you gave me. And when he buries, he says, hey, man, you wicked and lazy servant. I'm going to throw you out in the darkness. And I'm going to take your one. And I'm going to give it to the one who risked the most. That's what it says in the message version. He gave it to the one who risked the most. And he said, I'm not going to deal with the play it safe. It won't go out on a limb. And really what the passage is talking about is the law of maximization. I'm not holding you accountable for what you don't have. Too much of us spend time, we're trained, I'm not this or I'm not that. No, we're not going to talk about that. What do you have? And how can we grow it? How can we maximize what you do have? Because you're held accountable based on what you do have. And this is the thing. You realize the law of maximization. Everyone's held to the same standard. Make the most out of what you've been given. <laughs> That's your obligation. I ask people this all the time. What's more important, the gift or the gift giver? Right? And it's the, it's the gift giver. And how do you honor the gift giver? You maximize the gift they gave you. And you go, that's how you honor it. Like my mom. If I want to honor my mom, God rest her soul, she passed, right? She died in the home. She had ALS. I was fortunate enough to be able to hold her. She was, you know, she was passing. And she was, the, she gave me everything. I knew the way I could honor her was by who I became. After I got there in pro, I wish I'd understood in pro sports because I got older. Those are the things we start sharing back and forth. I'm really proud of who you are as a person. And I went, oh, yeah, as I've grown in this person spiritually, I've been more capable of honoring God and honoring the people around me who have sacrificed a ton to help me grow and to be there. So when you talk about strength and conditioning, an athlete's gotten where he's gotten to somehow. Someone helped. Someone's helped their progress. An athlete just isn't physical. There's existential givens of his existence. There's a spirit, there's a mind, <laughs> and there's a body. Yep. They all have to be built and maximized in order for, the, and we're talking about not for them to be great because guys can go be great because they're more gifted than everybody. I'm not talking about whether you, you need to do this in order to be great. No, it's not that. You need to do it in order to maximize. What's the best version you can be? Not are you better than this guy? You were born better than this guy. We're talking about maximization. Did you maximize everything you were given? Have you made the most out of it? That's the thing that we're held accountable on and that, that ultimately adds to the quality of our lives. Couldn't say it better. Now, 
this brings me to where you do exactly that, but more or less in the physical realm with the Institute of Human Performance, right? And actually, clearly, Institute yeah. of Human Performance went under. Um, ah. the, the guy lost the league. A bunch of stuff happened over there. I won't necessarily go into it. You talk about nightmare and learn a lot from a business endeavor. What we did, though, was we moved over to another location called Movement Fitness. Um, and we're over here now. Uh, the two owners um, with Derek and Leland uh, Sparks are the guys over doing an incredible job helping us getting things up and going. Incredible facility in terms of what we're working through. I'm, I'm, we're doing both like a joint venture and I have my own business underneath it, Maximize 360, that's under manual fitness that I'm building out now through a consultation side on multiple levels, whether it's through nutritional aspects, schedule aspects, the big one, the spiritual aspect of how it all intertwines. I've been doing it for the last 10 years where it's been a pivotal part. You know, you can go into QB1 on, on, that's on Netflix or it's the Snoop and Son show. And people are like, man, you're all the same thing, man. You're, you're out in front talking about, you know, the importance of who you are on the inside and spiritual principle and these other things. And so now we're moved over here to movement fitness. It's the same thing. It's just rocky. It's really new. Every time I start trying to explain it, people are like, ah. then we go in and they'll start to watch it and they'll go, oh man, now I see what you're talking about. I never, I've never seen that. Well, what okay. is it they're seeing? What are they seeing? So this is what I'll give you an example. Like we went to a parent night the other night. And if you're going to help a kid maximize and he's a high school kid, we got to talk with the parents too, because that's part of the equation. It's the biggest part of the equation, right? The parent in the home life is the, what, about the biggest influencing factor. All right. So we met with the parents and we talked about these things like, hey, what does it mean to maximize? How do you help a young athlete maximize? Hey, it starts in their mind. Are we messaging the athletes on their level of discipline? And, and Hebrews 12, you know, this would be an example. Hey, Hebrews 12, 6 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. That love and discipline go hand in hand. If I love you, then I'm going to discipline you. It doesn't mean I'm going to be punitive. It means I'm going to exert a level of accountability and truth that are going to help you grow in the direction that you want to grow in. No one looks at a stick tied to a baby sapling tree and goes, man, that stick is just punishing that tree. You know, that's just, you don't know, it's protecting the tree until the roots grow deep enough that it doesn't need the stick anymore and it can kind of move on, but it needs the discipline of the stick to know where to grow and kind of get it in the right direction. I love it. You know, we have a, uh, we, I've got this marriage mechanic. That's what I call him. Basically he's somebody that my wife and I have had since my 19 year old daughter was maybe a year old. So for almost 20 Pivotal. years, he just, we go in every few months and we get a tune up just like you do with your car. Why should your relationship with the person you love the most really be any different? So this marriage mechanic has, has gotten us through the rough roads and across the mountaintops and so on. But he brought up one really interesting part and it stayed with me was that we teach our kids discipline so that they can learn self-discipline. How do they discipline themselves? It's not something that is just innate within us. We need to be taught that. And you're right, it's not punitive. It's like, how do I walk a path that is the, the direction that I want to go? I need disciples, so to speak. I need people around me to help maintain a certain level of discipline. And those people, when they're not there, I'll have to rely on myself from what they've taught. So, I mean, right on for going to the parents and, and targeting the families. And I say target just as focusing in on them and knowing that it's, it's not just an athlete that's all alone in the gym, but they're bringing in everything that they've experienced in their life. You just nailed it. And, and self-discipline, if, if love and discipline go hand in hand, then if I love myself, I'm going to discipline myself. One of the biggest things I know that I had to learn and didn't learn at a young age, not because it wasn't modeled or my mom, you know, those other things, just one of those things I just looked and went, right, let me see if I can get away with not doing it. I don't want the discomfort or whatever. But when you learn it, that love and discipline go hand in hand and that discipline and self-care go hand in hand, that if I have self-love, it's not like I'm, I'm a vain, self-important, overinflated sense of self. You're going, no, it's my understanding of my need to nurture my gifts not, and nurture the gifts of those around me in order for not only me, but the community around me to grow. That that's that love and discipline hand in hand, but that you have, that's something that you have to learn. I don't care what anybody says. You know, it's in, in, in Hebrews 12, and it goes back down to like verse seven through nine, it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteous for those who have been trained by it. I'm not turning this into a religious segment, but that when we're talking about those things, what you just said, if I value myself, truly value myself, then I'm going to discipline myself in a way that allows me to grow and maximize the gifts I've been So you, do we teach that? And I go, as I've taught it and I've seen its fruit and seen how it's manifested in the athletes and seen what they've been able to do, it's been one of the most rewarding things, one of the most empowering things, like you say with your kids. As I teach them that, I empower them. That's, that's really real empowerment. I can make you faster. I can make you stronger. That isn't lifelong empowerment because at some point that's going to fade. You know, I, I ran a four or five when I was coming out professionally. I run a six, five right now. I mean, <laughs> the physical capacities diminish. <laughs> All that's left is what you have on the inside over the long haul. And that gives you greater ability to build a quality of life for the entirety of life, not just to this short stint. And to me as a practitioner, not that that's everybody, that's my, my understanding and my fixation and my big picture. No, it's fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm so happy that our conversation has gone in this direction because I, again, a little word to the listening audience that if you're thinking that what the heck has this got to do with it, it's, it's got more than any conversation we can have about wearable technology or, or, or anything that is the haute couture of sports conditioning right now, because this is the underlying, the firmament that is really what we need to build upon with our athletes. I mean, of course, we are our own worst critic, right? And, and there's words that we use within the gym, like failure. We're trying to get to failure. I, I don't use that word anymore. It's just going to be mm. temporary muscle fatigue. I don't want to go to failure. That's not what I'm aiming for. I want to go to success. So every time I fatigue my body, I'm going to get a little bit closer to, to success. You know, it's, it's that kind of word choice also that starts to plant seeds. I mean, it, it is so all encompassing that I can't believe that we don't hear, or maybe I'm just not listening properly, but I don't hear conversations like this taking place in, in weight rooms, in conditioning clinics, in conferences. That's it. So here you go. Here's my challenge to you, my friend, is the next time we're in a conference together and you're presenting, I want to hear this. I want to hear all about this. <laughs> hey, I promise you, when I go into the conferences, the, the biggest thing is, the foundational piece, I'll usually do two classes. And the first one, what happened is because I did French contrasting, which listen, I can go into stretch shortening reflex, post activation potentiation, concurrent activation potentiation, breathing uh, mechanics in order to increase muscle tension uh, to optimize height. I can go into force application. I can go into technical proficiencies on accelerative mechanic in order to create you, you name it, biomechanical advantages from a shin angle position. I, we can go into whatever restoring muscle length tension relationships to optimize force production. We, we can talk about any of these things from a very science-based, uh, we, we, we can talk about ischemic preconditioning or blood flow restriction training and, and trying to increase growth hormone levels and creating hypertrophic effects without the same muscle damage, you know, faster recovery time for restorative measures with people that are trying to restore movement patterns in this basic and how to periodize each one of these things from a developmental hierarchy that can ultimately optimize whatever that sport is. And if it's power, then it's this power number. It, you know, it's this power potential. It's this repeat ability on this power potential. All those things are there. I always say the same thing, but what will happen is at Gorman, it became very popular because everyone turned on, it got put into sports illustrated and, so everyone, oh, the French contrast, that's why they're so successful. He's doing this unique kind of thing. It was eight years ago, right? It just wasn't well known. And, and so people would come in and I'd be talking and then I'd go into the contrast and then everyone's phones would come out, right? And then all anyone would want to do is hear about the French contrast. And I was like, hey, I just preface this with, that's not where we start. Like these are the most important things. So when I would start to do the clinics, I go, hey, I want to do two classes. And I'm like, really? And I said, yeah. And what I would start with is the philosophy. And I don't know if you heard it in the clinic, like when we were at there, 
I only had the one class, but I started with it and there was a scripture that went up and these other different things. And I started talking about more of the philosophy first and I could see everyone like, oh, what in the world? I thought you were going to talk about <laughs> where are we at? And I was like, no, don't worry. We're going to go into that. I just always start in this direction. But what I would do is I wouldn't tell anybody. But then that first class was all philosophy and, and, and foundational principles, right? The boring stuff. And I was like, now, if you want to stay, I'm going to go over the other stuff on the next one. <laughs> force them to listen for, oh, to wait for the dessert right oh. so you'll hear it i go in there you'll hear it buddy that's great that's great okay we're coming up at the end of the hour here uh, what's what's some good contact information for those in the vegas area or or outside the vegas area for that matter that want to find out more about what you're offering with your team and everything good so you can email me at coach manny 24 7 at gmail.com um I'm open for any kind of conversation, relationship. My website's manualfitness.com, and it's M-A-N-U-E-L, manualfitness, all one word, dot com. And you can go on there and kind of see who I've worked with, some of my philosophies, and those kind of things. And I'm currently at a gym called Movement Fitness, uh, which is movementfitnesslv.com. Uh, and you can touch base with me if you want more content on spiritual uh, ways to tie in spiritual principle with training and the parallels between the two and how they both build upon each other. That spiritual atrophy has the same effect that physical atrophy has in terms of not exercising and growing and building. Any of those kind of things. I want to understand more about stretch reflex and accelerative mechanic or postural control in terms of integrated approach, which you do it. Rocky on an incredible level. That's the you, you go into the calculus level. I do the 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 one plus one equals two. I'm on the I'm on the addition. I'm on the basic addition. We come in and it's had incredible effects in terms of those things. But any of those kind of things that people are looking for, uh, even just relationship information, I'm open. Right on. Please reach oh, out. Let me know. That'll all be in the description below. Manny, thank you so much. This has been awesome. It's been good. We got to connect again, man. Oh, we will, definitely. And if you come out to Vegas or whatever the case would be, same thing. I'll contract you. Come in. We got NFL guys in here now. They're going in. And then another group coming in. I'll, I'll contract you for a week, man. You come in and do the, do the first 20, 30 minutes correct and then write out the protocol. Perfect. Well, it'll <laughs> right. happen. And that brings this episode of the Zealous Podcast to a close. Manny, what a guy. I just want to thank him from the bottom of my heart to share a little bit outside the box of strength and conditioning. Next week, we've got Anthony Renna. You may recognize that name. He is the founder and host of Strength Coach Podcast, along with Mike Boyle. He gets a lot of information out there to the listening audience. And if you haven't heard Strength Coach Podcast, then definitely tune into that. While you're at it, don't forget to subscribe here.